Well, there is much to talk about. Let's get to our panel. Joining us from New York is Richard Wolf. He's Professor of Economics Emeritus at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and a visiting professor at New School University. Manuel Suarez Mier served as the Minister of Economic Affairs at the Mexican Embassy here in Washington. Joining us from Ottawa is Christelle O'Day. She's Associate Director of the Conference Board at Canada's Global Commerce Center. And also with us is CGTN's Global Economics Analyst, Saruhan Atipolu. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Saruhan, let me start with you. Let's talk about these tariffs um, that have been imposed on solar panels and uh, certain washing machines. Uh, it will affect China and South Korea mainly because that's where they manufactured. Question is, why these countries, why these specific goods, and why now? Well, because there's a trade deficit with those countries, right, Anand? And the trade deficits are very bad things, and they need to be taken uh, care of. And what this uh, implies, what happened yesterday, is more of things to come. Nathan mentioned that. But it is important to understand that such measures not only hurt global economy, it also will come back to hurt the U.S. economy. Now, there is going to be a reaction. If we think that China and South Korea are going to say, OK, this is part of the deal. We have a trade surplus with the United States. We understand what's happening. I think we're fooling ourselves. So the question is, the president was very confident in saying there won't be a trade war. But let's see what China and South Korea do, what, what decisions they, they take. Because at the end of the day, their uh, exports are going to be affected by that. What is going to happen to the U.S. industry, solar panel industry? They're using inputs, quite a bit of inputs. Uh, they're selling to consumers. These costs are going to increase and will pass on to the American consumer, and that's going to hurt the industry. So in the long term, this is a bad move. In the short term, the president uh, gains a lot of uh, favor among his political uh, base. OK, let me go to Richard Wolf in New York. And Richard, President Trump campaigned on bringing manufacturing and, in consequence, I guess, jobs back to the United States. Now, if you look at these steps that he's taken over the past 24 hours, uh, does it help him fulfill that campaign promise? Well, it's part of the political theater that we've come to expect from Mr. Trump. It's all noise. It's all hand-waving. It's all promises, glowing predictions of what's going to happen. Here's the hard economics. No one knows what all of the primary and secondary effects of raising tariffs will be. They take months and, in some cases, years to work out. The other speaker has already correctly said it depends on the reactions that are taken by American consumers, by the Chinese, by the South Korean, to suggest that the president knows all that's going to happen and can tell us confidently that this will help manufacturing. That's a fantasy. That is pure gamesmanship for the political benefit. And the rest, we'll see how it works out. It is just as likely to damage jobs in the United States and raise the cost of living as it is to do the <laughs> lovely things he promises. But he hopes he'll get the benefit, and the disaster that comes later will be someone else's problem. So, Ron, just to get back to the possible responses that could come from China or South Korea, uh, can they seek legal recourse? Can they go, for instance, to the World Trade Organization? Sure, they can go. Um, there's NAFTA negotiations, as you know. They can also go to WTO. There's a special review uh, system that's out there. But uh, my concern, Anand, is how seriously WTO will be taken by the United States. We've already heard the president say quite a lot of negative things ab about WTO. And also, when a case is filed in WTO, it takes a long time, very long time, for that case to be resolved. So. Uh, it will go to WTO, I'm pretty sure it will, and it, the fact that it goes there is a sign that uh, China or South Korea or the country X is not going to take this kind of a uh, tariff increase, uh, which is against uh, free trade. It will go there, but I don't know about the resolution, how long it will take. Richard, I have one final question on this particular issue, and this is more of a political question. Uh, you take South Korea. This is a very close ally of the United States, one of its closest. It's a treaty ally. Uh, what kind of message does the president's action send to an ally like this? The same message he's been sending to so many of our, should I say, perhaps former allies. 
that he is busy building his political future, supporting his political base. And the chips may fall wherever they fall. Again, he's not worried about that. His job is to survive being an extremely unpopular president in this country for the majority of people, to shore up his base. He's going to do these things and hope that the negative consequences will take a long time, will be able, maybe, if he's clever, to blame somebody else for it. But you're going to see an increasing problem for more and more allies and former allies as they cope with the self-serving politics that are the governing ideology at this point, more even than they've been in the past. OK, let's move on to NAFTA. Manuel, the negotiations, as we've been reporting, have moved to Montreal in Canada. First, I want you to take a listen to what the chief U.S. negotiator, Robert Lighthizer, had to say about why the United States is unhappy with the existing agreement. Let's watch. For countless Americans, this agreement has failed. We cannot ignore the huge trade deficits, the lost manufacturing jobs, the businesses that have closed or moved because of incentives intended or not in the current agreement. So, question is, how can those U.S. concerns be addressed? Well, Mr. Lighthizer is a lawyer. He doesn't know anything about economics. And he shows his ignorance in statements like that. Uh, when you go to the supermarket, you buy from them. What, what do they buy from you? Nothing, right? So you have a trade deficit with your supermarket. How do you intend to correct that trade deficit with a trade agreement with a supermarket? You get your revenues from your employer, and you spend your money having trade deficits with all sorts of service providers and, and uh, merchandise providers. That's exactly the simul that we are doing here in countries. And there is another very important variable here, the macroeconomic picture. A trade deficit is, by definition, counterpart of a capital surplus. So more money is coming from abroad, being invested in the US, because the savings rate is very low. That's, that's uh, an equality. It has to be. So if you want to arrange your global trade deficits, you must arrange your imbalance between savings and investment. All of the rest is complete nonsense. And Mr. Lighthizer shows his complete ignorance and that of his boss, boss as well. OK, let me go to Christelle O'Day. She's in Ottawa in Canada. And Christelle, Canada's chief central banker says the ongoing negotiations are already hurting business investment. Does he have a point there? Absolutely. So at the moment, the uncertainty around the future of NAFTA is impacting um, firms' investing decision because Canada is a small open economy, so we rely extensively on our trade. And so trade um, accounts for two-thirds of GDP in Canada, and our trade with the U.S. alone supports 10 percent of Canadian jobs. So it's a significant amount, and it's through our access with NAFTA to the U.S. economy that we can attract investment because it gives us access to such a big customer base. So with NAFTA, um, with the future of NAFTA being now uncertain, uh, firms, if given the choice of investing in Canada or the United States, well, right now, it's very likely that they will opt for the United States. Right, and Christelle, we've got to the sixth round now, right now, and we've also heard these periodic uh, threats from President Trump to pull out of the deal. I mean, how deep is the concern in Canada that the president could blow up this deal, which is, what, 24 years? The Canadian government right now is really um, taking seriously the possibility that NAFTA could be terminated. However, they are still keen on um, for a successful outcome out of the negotiation. So um, there is the, the, the NAFTA the, the NAFTA, as it is right now, stands to be modernized. There are great ways to modernize it. For example, they, it could include a, a chapter on digital trade, which is a front where um, the negotiators have made progress on. And um, also, we at the conference board believe that after 24 years, it needs to be adapted to also um, it, it incorporate um, uh, opening in terms of cross-border mobility. Because NAFTA is, has been kind of the victim of its own success over the past 24 years. There are so many business people that cross the border between Canada and the United States to carry business that um, they that a lot of new a lot of new. Um, 
of new professionals have now emerged over the past 24 years, and these professionals should be included in the North American Free Trade Agreement in the revised NAFTA. So, um, so there are great prospects to modernize it. However, um, at the moment, um, the uh, the focus of the, renego the renegotiation has been on other other aspects um, that that you've mentioned already. Uh, just to build on on yeah. Christelle's point, uh, Canada is doing a great job, pretty much what Mexico did in 1992 93 in sending. Uh, politicians here to sell NAFTA, they are doing it. And it, some Canadian politicians call it an hug an American campaign. They have been doing it since President Trump has been elected into office, 300 meetings with cabinet ministers, with, um, with state governors, and they are just selling the idea of NAFTA. They've been doing that for a long time, and uh, they've done a good job so far. 